We'll look at several verses there in Galatians. We'll start off in chapter number 6. We're praying the mission conference is still going on down in Deland, Florida. Brother Dewey Mars is down there. Brother Alton Johnson is there. And Brother Justin went with them. So pray for them as they preach and teach. Souls will be saved. God's people will be stirred up. Amen. All right. Galatians chapter number 6. The Bible says in verse number 14. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. You know, Paul keeps coming back to the cross. He keeps all through the book of Galatians. He keeps coming back to the, uh, to the cross. In Galatians chapter 2, two of my favorite verses in the Bible, in verse 20 and 21, I am crucified with Christ. Again, he's coming back to the cross. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So everything is by Christ, what Christ did for us, not what we can do for Christ. Look at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now, I, I don't believe God made a mistake when he wrote the Bible, and, and I don't believe he uh, made a mistake when he preserved it in the English language preserved the Word of God in the English language. Christ hath, that's past tense, hath redeemed us from the law. Let me read to you something else here out of Ephesians chapter number 1. The Bible said, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. We have redemption through His blood. Christ hath redeemed us. That's past tense, isn't it? Amen? Amen? Now, what about the book of Colossians? Colossians, let me read another one to you. You don't have to turn to these verses. Just listen. Colossians 1.14 In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. And we could go on and on. Um, I do want to read one more to you out of the book of Romans chapter 3. The Bible says in verse 24 of Romans chapter 3, being justified freely, that means we're justified or declared righteous freely without a cause. We're declared righteous without any cause on my part, without any, any, anything on my part. I'm declared righteous based solely on the work of Christ. Now look here. I'm being justified freely by His grace through the redemption of, that is in Christ Jesus. Now, the word redemption means to purchase or to buy back. When did Christ purchase the human race? It, well, he had to. If it was by his blood and through his blood, he shed his blood one time. One time and one time for all. He didn't come back every time someone asked him for redemption. He didn't come back and die again. No, redemption has already taken place. I think what people are getting, getting confused is a matter of redemption and regeneration. The world is redeemed by the blood of Christ, purchased. You're not regenerated till you believe it, till you accept it. It becomes effectual to you when you accept it. You see the difference between redemption and regeneration. Well, back in the book of Galatians, chapter 3 and verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Christ became cursed when God took all of our sins and placed them on Christ and judged Christ. And you know, according to, Coloss to Colossians chapter 2, He took all of the handwritings of ordinances that was against us, taking them out of the way and nailing them to His cross. Christ always... Always, Paul goes back to the cross. Galatians chapter 4 
verse number five, well, verse number four and five, the Bible said, but when the fullness of time of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. We're redeemed to receive. You see that? Christ redeemed us 2,000 years ago. Now, the Bible tells me in the book of Hebrews, chapter number one, verse number three, that Christ is the brightness of God's glory. And it tells me that he's the express image of his person. And then it says, when he, Christ, by himself, had purged us of our sins, purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He didn't sit down because he was tired. He sat down because redemption was completed. He redeemed the human race. He purchased the human race. Now, if you want to get in on it, on the family, you need to believe it, amen, that it's already done. Don't be asking God to do something. It's accepting what he's already done. Now, let me give you some verses. Hebrews chapter number nine, verse number 26. Christ hath appeared once in the end of the world to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He put away, he paid the penalty of sin. So instead of begging God to do something with our sin, why don't you receive that forgiveness? Receive that reconciliation. Receive that redemption that's already happened, that's already taken place 2,000 years ago. And that's what we need to be preaching. Amen. That's what everyone needs to be preaching is it's an accomplished fact. Now, whether you believe it or not, it did happen 2,000 years ago. Now, if you want to go to heaven, you'll believe it. You'll believe it. In whom, the Bible says in Ephesians 1.13, in whom ye also trusted. After that, you heard the word of truth. How could I trust him till I heard the truth? And it tells me what I needed to hear in Ephesians 1.13, the gospel of our salvation, of your salvation. In whom also, after that, ye believed. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So the question is, is what did you believe when you said you believed? You cannot believe wrong and be right. I made a profession at nine years old and I didn't know who Jesus Christ was. I didn't know that he was God in the flesh. I didn't know he was Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. I thought he came into existence in Bethlehem's manger. But I would tell people in religious circles, I would say, God knew that I was going to believe that later, so he went ahead and saved me when I was nine. Based on the word of God, that was impossible. Are you, are you getting what I'm saying? After that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. It's imperative that you know who the Lord Jesus Christ is. In order to trust him, I need to know of him. I need to know what he did for me is sufficient. Paul constantly carries us back to the cross in the book of Galatians. Now, the Bible tells me in verse uh, 21 of Galatians chapter number two, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Did you know the wounds of Calvary certainly make Christ a marked man. For those wounds mean liberty to those who will trust him. Trust in him and him alone for your soul's salvation. Did you know that the religious crowd in Paul's day, which we would call the Judaizers, they boasted in external works and circumcision and so forth. Paul boasted in a crucified and risen Savior. There is only one way that a person could ever glory in the cross, and that is, number one, to know the person of the cross. At least 45 times, Jesus Christ is mentioned in this letter to the Galatians. 
The person of Jesus Christ captivated Paul. And it was Christ who made the cross glorious to him. So often, many times, I will sit, and I'm not going to call any names. I understand if you begin to criticize and bash people, you don't get, to, you don't get anywhere with that. I understand that. But so many times I have sit in the congregation and listened and begged and pleaded for that man behind the pulpit just to use the name Jesus one time, and I never heard it. I'm sure, Brother Lidecker, you've been in the same situation. I wanted them just to say Jesus. Why? Because there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. To know the person of the cross, to know who he is, when Paul was struck on the road to Damascus, when the light came down from heaven and a voice spoke, the Bible says immediately after that uh, he was baptized, he made known Christ. He made known Jesus that he was and is the Christ. And in order to recognize that Jesus is the Christ, you are recognizing deity. I stand so firmly that you will know that Christ is deity or you will never go to heaven. You will know that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh before you'll ever get saved. You say, Brother Owen, do you really believe that? With all of my heart. I don't believe you're saved without it. Amen. You're going to know who Christ is. Paul knew the person of the cross. The only way you're going to glory in the cross <laughs> is to know the person of the cross the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. The Bible said the Word in verse 14 was made flesh and He dwelled among us and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is God. Jesus is perfection. The only sacrifice that God would accept was a perfect lamb without blemish. Christ is perfect. Paul said in Sunday school this morning that we're all sinners and come short of the glory of God. There is nothing in our flesh that we could ever offer God to gain audience with a holy God, so we needed a substitute. We needed a perfect sacrifice. And when we trust Christ... God will impute the work of Christ, the righteousness of Christ to your account and declare you righteous. I don't look righteous. I don't feel righteous. But I reckon it to be true. I count it so, is what God said. Amen. Hallelujah for the Lord Jesus Christ. To know and glory in the cross is to know the person of the cross. Number two, it's to know the power of of the cross. The cross in Bible days was the ultimate example of weakness and shame. But to realize the person made the cross the foundation stone of our message. Christ died for our sins. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. The cross of Christ. You see, we talk about the cross. We understand that it's the person of the cross. We understand it's the work of redemption that was finished. He said it's finished on the cross. So when we say the cross, you understand that that's the focal point is the person of the cross. And then we know the power. To glory in the cross is to know the person to glory in the cross is to know the power of the cross. To glory in the cross is to know the purpose of the cross. It was to bring into the world a new people of God. Look at Galatians chapter 3 and look at verse number 27. The Bible says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye all are one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, 
Then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You see, Abraham's seed, Abraham's spiritual seed, and we're to walk in the steps of that faith according to Romans chapter 4. What faith? The faith of Abraham. What kind of faith did Abraham have? Abraham believed God, Genesis 15, and it was counted to him for righteousness. It was imputed or laid to his account. Amen. So to know the purpose of the cross, what is the purpose of the cross? To bring in a new creation. Amen. New creation. Old creation was headed by Adam, destined to fall. The new creation headed by the Lord Jesus Christ, and I guarantee you it's destined to succeed. Amen. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I'm waiting for the adoption to wit. In Romans chapter number 8, the adoption to wit is that glorified body that he's going to give me one day. Amen. When I trusted Christ, I was born in his family. I was born, the truth had happened over here at Calvary. Everything necessary for me to go to heaven happened 2,000 years ago. And then I was born in my mother and daddy's family. I reached the age where I had to make a decision. I said, this is true. I know it's true. God said it's true. My redemption is complete. The blood was shed. Forgiveness has been offered. God reconciled the world. He was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing my trespasses unto me. Why? Because he imputed them to Christ and judge Christ and told me I could go free. I believe that. I'm born in the family. I'm living out my salvation now, working it out, which is sanctification. And there's one day that my salvation is going to be nearer than when I first believed, and that's a glorified body. Amen. I'm closer in 2013 than I was when I got saved back there. Yes, sir. He's coming back. He's coming back, amen. And when he comes back, I'm going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, is what the Bible says. I'm going to have a body just like him. Thank God. Hold up the cross of Christ. <clears throat> and then look at Galatians chapter 6. In the time I have left, look at Galatians chapter 6. And we'll begin reading in verse number 11. The Bible says, you see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule... Peace be on them and mercy upon the Israel of God. You see the results by walking, by, the, the, verse number 16 is the results, the result of walking by this rule. That's those that have trusted Christ been saved, amen? There's peace. And then if you'll notice in verse 17, from henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, amen. It's said that the last words hold the most force. In this particular case, to the letter uh, to the Galatians, I believe it to be true. Paul summarizes all he has previously said in a few short words. And with one final stinging evaluation of the freedom-stealing Judaizers, Paul not only scrawls the gospel upon parchment, but seeks to imprint it indelibly on the hearts and minds of all of the Galatians and in our minds as well and on our hearts. In verse number 12 and 13, I want you to look at those that are labeled, and I label them, all show and no substance. All show and no substance in verse number 12 and 13 of Galatians chapter number 6. You see, many politicians have been accused 
of being all show and no substance. In other words, they care more about looking good and maintaining the appearance of significance than they do about actually making a difference. To some people, image is everything. Image is everything. Religion like politics can be approached with a style without substance and by requiring all of these outward legalistic actions, by requiring circumcision and ceremonial observances of the law, they were promoting a religion that made, that made people look good on the outside. And my dear friend, you and I know that the gospel works the opposite. The gospel works from the inside out, not the outside in. I don't know how many people in my day, and I heard it just this last week, I know I'm saved because I don't do the things I used to do. Did you know that's not good enough? Didn't you say, Brother Paul, that the best you can do is not good enough? Do you know the Bible says in Proverbs 14, Proverbs chapter 16, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Well, I know I'm saved because I quit my cursing and drinking and smoking and carousing. I quit that, so I know I'm saved. I know I'm saved because I. I know I'm saved because I. They've established their own righteousness. They're in a gray area. If, if your opinion is good, then everybody's opinion in this world is just as good. Because we've established our own laws of righteousness. We're living in some gray, ha hazy area and there is no absolutes. But we know better. We have the Word of God as our absolute. There is none righteous, no, not one. It's the righteousness of God. And who is that? Christ. I'm not going to heaven because I have changed. And by the way, re repentance, and, and I, I mentioned this, and I don't know why I'm putting this in just right now, and I hope I don't lose you. But, but uh, in the conference last week, I was talking about repentance. And a lot of people accuse me of not preaching repentance. I'm the biggest repentance preacher you'll ever hear. Yes, sir. I am. I'm, 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 I preach, I'm the biggest repentance preacher you'll ever hear. I believe Philippians chapter number three describes what true repentance is. Paul said those things that I thought were, were gained or, or I counted but dung that I might win Christ. Those things that I was trying to establish myself, I changed my mind. And realized it was all, all Christ. So repentance is a change of thought. Now, here, here's where Baptists get in trouble. And here's where a lot of people get in trouble in church. Because you change your mind about something, which is repentance. And, it, and I believe in repentance. Because you change your mind about something, it will produce a different action. You follow me? It, it will. It'll produce a different action. If I change my mind about a direction I'm headed in, I've, I've, repentance is change of thought, by the way, in case I didn't make that clear. But it will produce a, res, a result of a change of action. Now, that's where a lot of people stop, especially Baptists. Because my actions have changed, I must be saved. My dear friend, you're not saved because you changed your actions. You're saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And if that's not your basis of your object of your salvation, then you missed it. I'm just here to tell you this morning, you missed it and you're on your way to hell. There's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. You get in the book. You, if I've done anything this morning but to, to provoke you to emulation, then I've done my job. According to Romans chapter number 11, that was Paul's desire to provoke his, his people to emulation, which means competition. If I can get you in the Word of God to check out, to find out, to see if what I'm saying is true, then I've done my job. You get in the book. Repentance is a change of thought, so I do repent. Amen? All right, now, we're talking about um, this style without substance, this religion that makes people look good on the outside. It's not how good I look on the outside. It's what Christ did for me is the reason I'm going to heaven. Now, what makes people promote a good showing in the flesh? Well, the Bible tells us. Right there in verse number 12. Uh, the latter part of verse number 12, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. They, they, it could be persecution. By not condemning the idea of justification by the law, they avoid being persecuted. 
by zealous anti-Christian Jews. In other words, they're taking a middle of the road approach. And I'm sorry to say that the majority of religion today is doing exactly that. They do not want to be persecuted, so they will not stand upon salvation by grace through faith plus nothing and minus nothing. I had a lady down in Jasper, Tennessee. Well, from here, it'd be up in Jasper, Tennessee. Amen. Up in Jasper, Tennessee. And, and uh, it was at Ingalls Supermarket in Jasper, Tennessee. I was talking to her about salvation and, and, he, and, and what Christ did was eternal. And she said, well, oh, Brother Rowan, I don't believe in eternal security. Well, I should have focused more on just what Christ did and left it alone. But I went into verses on eternal security. And, and I, I remember, I, remember I, I got to the point where I was pleading with her. I was pleading with her to, to when you trust Christ, you know it's eternal. And a lot of times we, and, and I, I made a mistake, a lot of times we spend most of our time convincing of eternal security when if a person really gets born again, he'll know it's eternal. Yes, you, you, yeah, you know that. And, and if you know your Bible, you know that if you think you can lose it, you never had it. Because if you think you can lose it, then you're, then you're telling yourself that you have to meet a standard in order to stay saved. And by doing that, you have added to the cross. And that makes the cross of Christ of what? Of none effect. So anyway, I'll never forget what she said. And she said, Brother Rowan, my life is good. My family is good. We're all in church. Why don't you just let me believe like I want to? I'll never forget that. That stuck with me, brother, for years. You know what? I thought then I could either take the middle of the road approach for fear of losing her and her family or I could stand on the truth of the gospel. Well, I chose, thank God, to stand on the truth of the gospel. Amen. And I did it without, without being mean or abrasive. But if we, don't, and if we don't stand on the truth of the gospel, and by the way, when you do stand on the truth of the gospel, you're, you're going to suffer persecution. You're, you are going to suffer persecution. Well, let, let's go on here. There's another reason that people um, go with that style with no substance. And, and that's because they want to boast. They, they like the boasting. Verse number 13 of Galatians 6, For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. You see, these folks weren't really interested in a moral transformation of the Galatians. They didn't care anything about their soul. Um, hold your place in Galatians. I'm going to wrap it up here, but I'm going to go to John chapter 8. Go to John chapter 8 with me. The, these Judaizers, these boasters, they didn't care anything about salvaging the Galatian soul. All they wanted was a to boast. Um, what did I say? John chapter 8. Let me get over there. All right. Um, uh, well, just back up verse 1. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again to the temple. And all the people came unto him and sat down and taught. Uh, he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that, that should, uh, such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, verse number 6, tempting him that they might have to accuse him but Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them. In other words, they were not one, the one least bit concerned about this woman's soul. All they wanted to do was to trap Jesus Christ. When we get to the book of Galatians, we're seeing the same thing. They're, they were not concerned at all about the souls of these Galatians. 
All they wanted was something they could write down on paper and boast about. In John chapter number 8, they were not concerned about this woman's soul at all. All they were concerned about is trying to trip up Jesus. And then if you'll notice, in verse number 11, after it was all said and done, and I'm not preaching on John chapter 8. I think most of you know the story. But in verse number 11, Jesus said, um, Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Now, for Jesus to say that, Jesus knew that he was one day going to pay for her sin with his own blood. Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Well, thank God for that. Back in Galatians, these people were, were boasting, boasting. They were not teaching circumcision and the law so that the Galatians would attain new heights of spirituality. They wanted to boast or glory in their number of converts. How big? How much money? How many missionaries? How many baptisms? How many rededication? The number games is the most fleshly game any church can play. It really is. That's nothing in the world but external. And instead of aiming at the number of professions and the number of rededications. And so if there was a, Brother Slade was given a story yesterday. Um, and he said, he said he was calling around looking for a bus, a church bus. And out of the blues. Now, for those of you that's been in the ministry, you can appreciate this because it's probably happened to you. All he was doing was talking to another pastor about a church bus. You know the very first question out of that pastor's mouth on the phone? The very first, very first question. After Brother Slade's explained that he was looking for a bus, the very first question, well, so how many do you have on your staff there? Now, that might not mean a lot to you, but what's that got to do with the price of eggs in China? What, what does that have to do? Price of <laughs> and a bus. What's that got to do with the price of a bus? You, you, you see what I'm talking about? I'll get phone calls. Well, how many are you running? How many missionaries do you support? How many, how many? And I'll, you know, you, I try to change the subject. It's not that I think I'm better than they are, but that gets into, you know, to, to me that gets off the page. And that, that would put me in the same category as these legalistic, boasting varmints, arrogant, nose up in the air. They better be glad cows can't fly is all I can say. <laughs> Amen. That's ridiculous, isn't it? Boasting. Well, that kind of Christianity is external. And then according to verse 14 and 15, we need to boast and boast in Christ alone. Who gets the credit for salvation? Jesus Christ. Who should, we, who should we exalt and praise and glorify down here? Jesus Christ. I don't know of anyone else that's worthy, do you? I, I, don't, I don't know of, of anyone else that's worthy. We need to lift him up. We need to praise him. God became a man, left the glory of heaven, became a man lived a sinless life. Nowhere to lay his head. He went to Calvary. They beat him unmercifully. You know that. They spit on him. Beat, I mean, beat him. Literally, skin be ripped off his, 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 his body. And the psalmist said that he could stare at his bones. He could see his bones. You see his innards functioning because he, and he died. He was walking with his cross all the way up to Calvary, up Gabbatha, and these women came out crying and he looked over at them. And you see, I believe Christ carried his cross. I know Simon of Cyrene uh, was compelled to help him, but I believe that Simon of Cyrene just picked up the end of it. I don't believe the Lord would ask us to do anything he didn't do. I believe he had his cross. And those women were crying and instead of crying, he just smiled at them as through, through all of that mangled mess of flesh. He looked at them and said, don't wait for me. Weep for yourselves and your children. You know why? I'm going to Calvary. There's where I'm going to take care of your sin. And you can be set free. Amen? You'll be made free if you believe it. That's why I'm going. Thank God for Christ. Thank God for Calvary. Thank God for the cross. Thank Him for the resurrection. Thank Him for being at the right hand of the Father today. Making intercession for Jimmy Allen and David Rowan. 
Brother Connor, all of you, thank God for Jesus. Let's stand to our feet, please, if you will.